Welcome to Late Antiquity and Early Christian Art. Today we're going to be looking at all sorts of examples of early basilicas and mosaic wall designs and um, illuminated manuscripts from the uh, Christian world. We're also going to look at examples of synagogues from um, Judaism, from the Jewish people, uh, in places like Dura Europos in Syria. Um, we'll definitely focus on a lot of Christian architecture in both Rome and in Ravenna. A lot of the um, world famous uh, Christian mosaics from early basilicas and churches are actually in Ravenna. Um, and of course, we will continue to learn more about Constantinople as um, the capital of Christendom in the East. So let's get started with kind of understanding some of our goals for today's um, topic. We want to understand the influence of religion in the art of the Roman Empire in late antiquity. And we remember where we left off learning about Constantine as the first Christian emperor of um, the, uh, the Roman Empire. And we had learned that he had moved his capital to Constantinople, which is present day Istanbul in Turkey. Uh, moved it from Rome to the east in Constantinople. And of course, um, we will see how the religion of Christianity comes to influence the art made during this time. Uh, examine the art forms and the architecture of late antiquity, understanding the different medias used to create early Christian art. So we'll see lots of um, new innovations with mediums and technology with this uh, chapter as well. Uh, find Roman stylistic features that are incorporated into early Christian art. So of course, it's not as if pagan Roman influences just cease to exist. Of course, we're going to see a kind of a fusion and a kind of um, blending, you know, if you will, of styles and influences all throughout this chapter. And we're going to know and cite artistic and architectural terminology from the period. Okay, so the art of late antiquity, uh, we want to talk about um, right understanding how Roman art and architecture changed as a result of Christianity and the decisions of Constantine. So we had learned about the crisis of the third century last class and this period of persecution where um, people of various faiths, whether it be you know Judaism, Christianity, and so on, uh, were being persecuted by some of the pagan emperors. And of course, um, we all know that religious warfare is not going to bid very well for the world and for the economy. And so Constantine, of course, um, was interested in signing off on the Edict of Milan, which allowed for um, religious tolerance. And this was in um, the year 1313. Um, you know, this was 300 years after the life of Christ and, you know, the dogma of Christianity had 300 years to be developing. And, um, of course, during this period of persecution, Christians were um, essentially worshiping and burying their dead um, underground in the catacombs um, because, of course, they, they weren't really safe to worship out in the open. So um, after the Edict of Milan, allowing for more religious tolerance, this idea of um, you know kind of um, halting the religious warfare and so on allowed for more economic freedom uh, for all different types of people with all different types of faith to exchange in free markets and trade and to travel without the threat of uh, fear of um, death. And of course, this allowed the Christians to begin to build churches and basilicas above ground. So when we're talking about Roman art and architecture, how it changes, well, during the age of Constantine, we start to see Christian basilicas being built. Um, overlay influences of specific images of Christ. So this is going to be interesting, actually seeing some of the first images of Christ. And it's going to be also very rare to see images of Christ in a statue form. Main reason being 
that um, this is what the pagans did, and the Christians saw that as cult worship, uh, you know, worshiping false idols, and so on. So the Christians didn't typically make big statues of Jesus Christ and, you know, worship to those statues because that's sort of more of a pagan idea of worshiping. However, they did embrace biblical storytelling through mosaics, so through 2D art, as well as the illuminated manuscripts through the book arts, which we're going to continue to learn about in terms of those different medias, particularly the frescoes and the mosaics are going to be interesting. And we are going to continue to learn about these new terminologies. So the late antiquity period is really what we're referring to is the late antique pagan period. So we're still going to see um, pagan influence. Uh, but we're going to also see early Christian art influences as well as early, you know, uh, Judaism uh, images from the Hebrew Bible and so on. Uh, monotheistic faiths as well. So uh, let's go ahead and start there. Let's start with the interior of the synagogue in Dura Europos in modern day Syria. Um, this is, of course, a synagogue, the interior of an early synagogue, of course, which is a house of worship for the Jewish people. Uh, which is obviously a monotheistic faith. And um, some of the scenes that are depicted in this uh, um, uh, series of um, wall uh, paintings uh, are depicted from the Hebrew Bible, which is the Old Testament. And specifically, we're going to see lots of images from um, the Torah, which um, uh, you know, really is, is a scroll. In fact, actually, this niche here um, supposedly housed in ancient, you know, Torah, which was the law of God revealed um, to Moses, you know, by God, and uh, was recorded in the first five books of um, the Hebrew Bible, which is the, old, the, old Pental the Pental, um from the Old Testament. So um, we can see some of the narrative uh, unfolding here. And these are all painted with egg tempera on plaster walls. So let's take a look at this scene to the right of the niche uh, right here. Um, and we see Samuel anointing David, a detail of the mural painting. Now, of course, this is coming from, you know, Hebrew biblical narrative. So what we're seeing is the emphasis on storytelling, right? And for anybody who's interested in you know, illustrating a story, it's going to be really important to have, you know, clear figure clustering, to, uh, clear um, symbol, symbols or descriptions. They're going to let us know who's who in the story. Now, it's also important to recognize that the first um, uh, people um, who are, you know, worshiping in the synagogue may not be able to read and write. So the visual image is obviously gonna be important uh, and the narration, the, the, the orator, the person who is telling the story, um, who's leading the, the sermon, uh, the rabbi, uh, has a visual image to kind of go along with uh, the story and help assist the worshiper in um, understanding the, uh, the um, the narrative. So of course, single anointing David. What we see here is uh, the story where um, Samuel is told uh, by God to go to the house of Jesse, and um, you know there is going to be you know an important uh, character that's going to sort of change the course of 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 these future you know biblical stories, and find you know this chosen son, the son of Jesse's. So when he gets there, of course, there are many sons and he's looking at all the sons and he's like, no, that's, that's not him. That's not him. He's like, don't you have any more sons? He's like, yeah, there's David, but you know, he's out in the field. He's, he's tending to the sheep. And Samuel's like, oh yeah, that's who I need. Right? So of course they bring David and this is of course the, um, the, uh, you know, going to be um, David, David at, 
you know, who we know is going to go on to fight Goliath, right? The giant Goliath, David, who's going to go on to become a king. So, of course, he's going to be instrumental in um, God's work, right? According to um, the Hebrew Bible and, you know, of course, you know, with Christianity as well. So, uh, here he is anointing him. So, he has sort of like a writing, and he's pouring oil. He's anointing David's head with oil. Now, um, interesting enough, because this is a stylization, because this is a new uh, religion, and we have new sorts of modes of working here, and we notice that there's a very schematic way in which everything is drawn. You know, we're not seeing lots of modeling and realism and value like we had seen from the Greco-Roman world in the past. This is more about um, style, stylizing the image, sort of almost flattening it really to just, again, basic symbols. Um, we also have some confusion with spatial depth, right? Um, if we kind of look, not all the figure um, of the sons of Jesse have all of their legs really. Um, it's, it's again very stylized, not really focused on naturalism, but more focused on the narrative, which is, you know, so important for this time period. Other images um, of uh, some frescoes here from um, uh, Jewish catacombs would be the Ark of the Covenant with two menorahs, um, and this is from a Jewish catacomb in uh, Villa Tortonia in Rome from the third century. So we're seeing some um, sacred objects, some holy objects of the Jewish faith there on uh, display, almost like in a still life. And of course, these catacombs, catacombs all throughout Rome, catacombs that, as we are seeing, um, are going to be underground chambers um, with imagery and iconography from um, the Jewish faith as well as from the Christian faith. Uh, and these catacombs, right, are all throughout Rome and oftentimes, um, you know, layers and layers and layers deep, um, multi-leveled, multi-layered. Um, and if you, you know, do ever get to visit Rome, you can actually explore some of the catacombs as well. Um, here's an example of catacomb um, with the loculi in the um, rock cut into the tufa, into the local stump. Now, of course, these loculi, this is where the bodies of the dead uh, would be uh, buried. Um, so, of course, we know for uh, both the Jewish people and the uh, early Christians, because they were being persecuted, um, they weren't really able to freely uh, exercise their rituals uh, when it came to um, funerary practices um, above ground, out in the open. So uh, we see lots of the funerary art and funerary practices being conducted right underground in these catacombs. And we'll also see um, wall painting and frescoes and you know, they're gonna be decorating the um, the walls of these catacombs as well. Um, and with early Christian images, we're going to start to look at the stylization a little bit more and understand some more of these mediums like fresco, uh, mosaic, and then later with uh, illuminated manuscripts. So this is a famous mural known as the Good Shepherd, which depicts the story of Jonah with Orents. Um, this one is from the uh, cubiculum in the catacomb of St. Peter and Marcellinus in Rome. Now, um, the orants, okay, the orants, this is one of your terms from the, um, the chapter. And the orants are uh, known as prayer uh, pose. It's prayer pose or prayer, prayer figures. And in early Christian art, Orants um, weren't praying with their hands together and their heads bowed. Um, that depiction of prayer actually doesn't really show up until about the medieval times. Um, and, and that had a lot to do with the 
uh, Christian medieval kings and how they wanted people to bow and put their hands together in prayer. And um, that gesture is actually not what we see with early uh, praying figures, uh, especially not during late antiquity and early Christian art. Prayer poses actually were very jubilant. People had their hands up and out and open, and they were uh, in sort of an, uh, a gesture of jubilation. And it kind of makes sense if you really think about it, because you know, being um, a Christian during this time period, you weren't really able to practice your religion out in the open. Uh, so in the art, this idea of a jubilant, more extroverted sort of way of praying is sort of manifesting itself through the, the auric pose. Um, so that's something to kind of think about. So we have prayer, prayer figures, and of course we have um, Jesus depicted as a good shepherd there in the very center. Now, the earliest images that we have of Jesus, uh, especially in the um, wall painting narratives, are going to be depicting him as a good shepherd. Oftentimes, um, it's not going to be until later that we start to see images of the crucifixion and then Jesus as a uh, depicted as a king, um, because that's not really happening until after the crucifixion, right? Until he's sort of born again, right? Um, and so the earliest images are going to be the stories of him as a good shepherd tending to the flock, right? The sheep, right, are the followers, and so on. Um, so we see him with his the sheep, and he sort of actually has a uh, an animal over his back there. He's sort of bringing, um, I guess you could say, like a lost follower, sort of back to the flock. Um, and then, of course, in the lunettes, these semicircular shapes uh, around the tondo, around the circular format, are uh, images depicting the story of Jonah and the whale. Now, of course, we might be familiar with the story of Jonah and the whale, where, um, you know, he, Jonah is told by God, according to um, the Bible, to go to preach to people who are um, pagan and so on, and uh, he's supposed to go there and um, you know bring the word of God to them. And he's in a boat. He's on the way there, and then all of a sudden he's sort of like, I don't know. I, I I'm not going to do this. And so he's kind of you know going a different direction. He's basically he's not following what God asked him to do. And so he's on this boat, and of course, you know, the storm hits. And supposedly the storm is sort of brought upon him by God, and he he's tossing and turning in the waves, and all this rain is sort of falling on him, and he gets thrown overboard, falls into the ocean, and of course a giant whale gulps him up and he's in the belly of the whale for many days and many nights he he actually didn't die and while he's in there he's sort of thinking long and hard about you know what um what he did right to to sort of shy away from what god asked him to do and so he repents and god spares jonah so we can actually see, you know, him getting kicked off the boat and this giant actually what looks more like a sea serpent rather than a big giant sperm whale, uh, you know, ha is attacking him, scoops him up. And then here we actually see the, the whale spitting him out. Uh, basically, he's now been given this second chance, right? He's been given... Um, retribution he's been forgiven right and now we see him reclining sort of hanging out you know and sort of basking in the approval that he now has of God right so now he's sort of has more hit, renewed his faith and his trust and so on so it's a it's an interesting story obviously it's a story that's very dramatic it has an apex it has a resolution like all good stories do and, and it has a, a moral to the story, right? A biblical moral to the story. 
All right, so more with these Roman sarcophagi. So I know we had really been studying these um, sarcophagi and we had uh, learned that the Romans were really um, uh, so well known for their detailed designs. You know, when it came to funerary art, they were exporting these all throughout the world as far away as Asia. And now we're starting to see some early Christian uh, sarcophagi, right? Um, because now, you know, Christians are um, starting to, you know, be able to worship above ground because it's 359 um, after all. So we, it's a several decades after the Edict of Milan here. So um, we see this sarcophagi with depictions um, from um, Old and New Testament themes. Of course, Old, Old Testament and New Testament. So we've got you know, just a few examples here, um, of course, oh, we have, like, images of um, Abraham sacrificing Isaac at the altar. We have images of um, uh, Jesus, you know, on the donkey as he enters into Jerusalem. Images of Adam and Eve with the serpent in the garden. We have Daniel in the den of, den of lions. I mean, you've got all sorts of... Um, almost staged like scenes embedded into these niches that are coming from uh, biblical stories, um, Old and New Testaments. Um, and we can see that the niches are sort of framed in arches and some kind of pediments. We, we see some sort of Greco-Roman references to architecture, especially when it comes to the columns. So we're seeing kind of a, again, a sort of a blending here of um, a pagan Roman past when it comes to some of these architectural ornamentations and the, just the um, tradition of, you know, making, you know, carving marble sarcophagi. And then we see Old and New Testament uh, biblical storytelling happening. Another good example here, we have the philosophers with Orents and Old Testament scenes. Um, so we have the philosopher here. Uh, with a scroll, he's sort of unfolding a scroll in front of him, and then the orant here with the hands up in jubilation. We can see um, this is almost as if it's Jonah, right, with the with the the whale, or in this case, the sea serpent. Um, we have uh, actually, you know, a good shepherd here who's bringing the sheep back from the flock, and so on. So we can kind of see um, some trending, um, similar images that are starting to show up uh, in these early Christian works. Now, um, I mentioned that uh, images of Jesus in statue form are very rare. And Christ seated here from Civita Latina in Italy is exceptionally rare for the very reason that it was rare to find standalone statues of Christ during ancient Rome. This is one of the major exceptions. Jesus is presented as young and he's unbearded, similar to his depiction on the Roman sarcophagus. Uh, he wears a Roman toga and sandals of an educated man from Roman society, and he holds an unopened scroll in his left hand, although that, that is missing in this slide. It's in fragments. Um, it is one of the few remaining sculptures of Christ from such an early period. Um, so again, incredibly rare um, to see images of Christ in 3D form simply because um, the earliest Christians believed that idol worship, right, worshiping cult statues, was a sin. That's how they viewed the pagan cult statue, cult worship, um, to be perceived. So this is pretty rare, but again, it's sort of this time period where artists and early Christians are sort of developing their own styles and there still is this tradition of art from the past, right? From the late antique pagan past. Um, and this long tradition in Roman art of carving statues, right? So we see um, 
a unique and rare example with um, this image of Christ seated. So these artistic changes in Constantine, we're going to continue to look at how and why religious ideas are expressed right in early Christian art, understanding the origins and development of specific images of Jesus Christ, citing illustrations of religious architecture and their origins, particularly the basilicas, and understanding the medias and the methods and the techniques used to create the art uh, and also more about this terminology. So the basilica, the basilica plan and the central plan in early Christian architecture. Okay, what is the difference between a basilica and a church? Well, obviously in early Christianity, the earliest Christianity is, you know, Roman Catholicism. So, um, basilicas were where we see, you know, popes and bishops and some of the earliest, you know, religious leaders um, performing um, and, and sermoning, you know, uh, performing sermons to the people. And um, these houses of worship are incredibly historic because all of these basilicas all throughout um, the Roman world were built, not just happenstance, just built whenever and wherever willy-nilly. They were built in very specific locations. Um, mostly they were built on the tombs of martyrs, the martyrs from, um, you know, the period of persecution, the martyrs, the Christians who were killed and tortured and you know with their bodies you know burned and stretched and limbs cut off and skin flayed and heads put on you know grills and you know their bodies you know drugged through the streets until you know they there was nothing left of them um all of these martyrs their bones their tombs this is where we see the basilicas being built so those bones are in tombs underground, right in the catacombs. When these basilicas are able to be built above ground, the Christians pick these specific sites, right, to break ground to build their, their basilicas. So here, um, St. Peter's Basilica, of course, probably the most famous basilica in all of Christendom, which is in Rome in Italy, um, and you know, today the, right, the Vatican. Um, and what we are looking at is a restored cutaway view of one of the earliest um, plans, right, for St. Peter's. It was actually begun in 319 by Constantine himself, and it was believed to be built over the tomb of St. Peter. Now, you can see um, it has a, a very traditional basilica plan. It at one time did have mosaics and so on. Today, when you look at St. Peter's in Rome in the, at the Vatican, the structure that you actually are looking at is not the one that was built in 319. It's undergone all sorts of renovations and remodels and things over the year. And so this structure that you actually see uh, is actually in the style of the Baroque design, which we learn about later. And actually the dome was designed by Michelangelo after the architect Bramante. So there, there have been um, renovations. Michelangelo had some, some hand in this. Um, of course, right over here is the Sistine Chapel with Michelangelo. So what we are really looking at is a Renaissance, a late Renaissance Baroque structure that we see today. But it's important to remember that the earliest form of St. Peter's Basilica was obviously um, a, a late antique design. Um, so this is St. Peter's Basilica from the view of the Tiber River. And of course, we see um, that iconic dome in that image. The overall plan is in the shape of a cruciform. So it has this Latin cross plan. It actually looks like a cross. This is gonna be pretty typical of early um, Christian churches. And like 
for basilicas. And like all of the earliest churches in Rome, both this church and its successor had the entrance to the east and the apse at the west end of the building, right? The sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Um, and it is famous for a site of Christian pilgrimage and for its liturgical function. So of course, being on, built on the site of the tomb of St. Peter in the you know, biblical scripture, you know, you know, Peter is the rock, right? Um, the church is the rock. Um, so uh, we can see that, um, you know, the church is sort of built on the foundations of, right, this rock, this martyr uh, of the Christian faith. Um, so who was St. Peter? Well, uh, this is a painting from the later, you know, Renaissance world, the Baroque world by the famous painter Caravaggio, and we'll learn about him next semester. Um, but it's depicting the crucifixion of St. Peter, and St. Peter actually, he was crucified, but he was crucified upside down. Um, he didn't want to be crucified the same way that Jesus was crucified. So he's crucified upside down um, and tortured. Okay, if we go inside of St. Peter's, we will continue to see elaborate, more Renaissance and Baroque uh, styles um, and designs. But an important aspect to understand is that this giant baldacchino, it's the high altar. And of course the high altar, it's a canopy that's built, you know, this is where the Pope will, you know, have sermons, but it's actually built supposedly on top of where the tomb of St. Peter is. So it kind of demarcates the location, uh, although, you know, we've never seen the bones of St. Peter, but, you know, the Vatican says, hey, the bones are there, right? Um, but you can tour the crypt, just like in all basilicas, you, you know, and I love to do that, to go take tours of the crypts, you know, tales from the crypt. And um, so we would always go, there's actually a little gate here, and we would go in the gate and go down the stairs. Uh, this is the entrance to the crypt right here. And then you can peruse the crypt and look at all of the, the, um, the tombs there and the uh, sacred relics and so on. Anyhow, the Baldacchino is important uh, because it demarcates the location of the remains of St. Peter. And these are just some more photos. This is the actual uh, piazza, the, the open air plaza in front of St. Peter's Basilica with the double colonnade designed by Bernini. And this is a Egyptian obelisk that was brought back from ancient Egypt and erected there in the center of the Piazza. And this was Pope, the Pope Francis, actually, in 2016. We happened to be there on the Jubilee here, and we got really close to Pope Francis, riding around his Pope Mobile, of course, as the Mercedes Benz there. So we got we got really close to that. And the Sistine Chapel is actually right there. Okay. Uh, well, the interior of Stanza Costanza in Rome, this is a good example of a central plan. Now, this is very unique because of the uh, architecture here. Now, of course, these early churches and basilicas um, were, you know, built during the time before electricity. So how... Uh, are they revolutionizing the way that air and light and everything are going to sort of flow into the space? And Santa Costanza is just really beautiful in the way the architects thought about the play between light and dark and the sort of the spiritual aspects of that. So it has an arched arcade that has 12 pairs of these giant granite columns and they're decorated with capitals and kind of a Greco-Roman design and it supports the drum below the dome. It's actually a domed structure and uh, it separates the area of the ambulatory beyond 
which is much darker. So this is the ambulatory on the outer ring. And that intersection, light from the windows in the Claire story of the dome up at, at the top, doesn't reach this dark area. So you get this almost bursting, you know, sense of light and shade. The other thing that's really cool about uh, Santa Costanza is that it initially was built as a mausoleum for Constantine's um, daughters, one or both. He had two daughters, Constantina, of course, and Helena. So it was a mausoleum for his children. Um, and then later, uh, it was a church. So interesting. It's really built as, you know, funerary art, as a kind of a meditative space for Constantine's uh, family, for his uh, offspring. And the other cool thing about it is that if you look up into the, the ambulatory, into the vaulted ceiling of the ambulatory, you see this beautiful mosaic. Now, all a mosaic is, is um, uh, inlays of colored tile, and or could be glass, um, and or pebbles. But we call this sort of colored glazed tile or glass tesserae. Tesserae, so little tesserae tiles. And what's unique about it is it's a Bacchic scene. It's scenes uh, with these uh, figures and followers of Bacchus, these little, you know, almost Cupid or little Cupid, Cupid, um, Puti type characters. Um, and while most mosaics have a very clear Christian image, um, those in ambulatory could be considered Dionysiac or Bacchic, right? Dionysus or Bacchus, the Greco-Roman, you know, god of the wine, uh, with their images of grapes, fruit, birds, and mythological figures. Even some of the floor mosaics were similar in style to those in the ambulatory, filled with Cupid's birth, Bacchus, and grapevines. This shows the merging of pagan and Christian values in Rome, and actually, the wine itself, I mean, they're, they're literally stomping on the wine with their feet, right? They're crushing the grapes to make wine, to ferment the skins of the grape. And if you think about, you know, it in uh, Christian ritual and the liturgical functions of the church, there is the Eucharist, right? The Eucharist typically is um, when the um, church um, uh, worshipers will eat some bread right as the body of christ and they will eat or drink some wine as the blood of christ you know and depending on what church uh, you go to if you attend church maybe it's an oyster cracker and a little bit of welch's grape juice and if you're a roman catholic it's probably tuscan bread with you know a nice chianti or something right but it's a symbolic the bread and the wine is symbolic of the body of christ and the blood of christ and so by consuming th that, right, by partaking in the Eucharist, you are um, performing, you know, a, a religious ritual. And so wine actually played a role in the religious functions of the Catholic Church in the earliest, you know, Christian uh, uh, examples. So interesting because we know wine was important when it came to the rituals for the pagans. So this is a good example of where we see something as um, merging, merge the merging or something that's sort of similar. Um, not everything is so different, although these religions are very different from one another. We see some similarities. Um, and so we mentioned that um, this you know, was a mausoleum for Constantine's daughters. Um, so here's the sarcophagus of St. Constance. Of course, she was given sainthood, Constantina, um, the daughter of Constantine. And th this is a giant purple palfrey marble sarcophagi that's taller than me. Um, and you'll see it when you tour the Vatican museums. You'll actually see this giant um, gorgeous sarcophagus. 
Um, here are some other examples of some of the fruits and the foliage and the flora and the fauna of nature here. Birds amid the branches, the grapevines, and the ambulatory there. So you can really see the design, how they're sort of modeling the, the tesserae to create, um, you know, just a gorgeous example. And we have actually some examples of late antique, um, early um, mosaics actually at the St. Louis Art Museum. If you've ever um, visited, uh, you might uh, recognize um, the style. All right, the Church of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome. It's one of the first churches that was dedicated to the Virgin Mary, of course, the mother of Jesus, and honored with the title of the Basilica. So, um, of course, we're looking at a Renaissance structure now, but in late antique um, days, it would have been a, um, a sacred site. And in the interior, it's very well known for all of its uh, uh, mosaic um, uh, scenes, biblical scenes, uh, all the way around the structure. So let's take a look at some of those so that we can kind of examine more of these um, different methods when it comes to the mosaics. So inside Santa Maria Maggiore, uh, one of the scenes um, is the parting of Abraham and Lot. So, of course, we have um, figure clustering going on here. And we can see Abraham is, is parting, Lot's going the other direction. Abraham is with his son Isaac over here. And, of course, they, we know they're going to go on to, uh, you know, become or perform... Um, you know, important, um, uh, you know, religious acts, and they're going to become instruments of good for, for God's plan, God's work, right, according to the Bible. And then Lot, of course, with his two daughters, they're going to Sodom and Gomorrah over there, right? And this is going to kind of be perceived as instruments of quote-unquote evil, so we kind of have the good and the bad, um, the good and the evil, um, the parting uh, of ways here, um, part of the story. Um, so we can see stylization and the figure clustering. It's not at all lifelike, is it? Um, for instance, Lot's daughters, they're, they're, you know, grown women, but they're like half his height. Why is that? Well, we see the Christians now are utilizing hierarchical scale. There is a little bit of hierarchy of scale coming into play here because, you know, we our main characters, right, are Abraham and Lot. The secondary characters are Isaac and the daughters. So, you know, we're seeing some examples of hierarchy of scale coming into play it not being focused so much on realism, but rather a, a symbolism and a stylization that is feeding into the biblical narrative and helping the viewer understand the story uh, plot. All right, the Mausoleum of Gala Placidia in Ravenna. Now, um, on the exterior, um, the Mausoleum of Gala Placidia doesn't look all that fancy. But inside, there are some good examples of um, mosaics and things like this. But Ravenna itself is a very historic site. In fact, Ravenna in Italy is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it has the largest quantity of Christian mosaics anywhere in the entire world. It actually beats out Rome goodness grief. Um, so it has the most amount of mosaics, uh, uh, Christian mosaics, in this one town in Ravenna. And Ravenna is a port city in Italy, um, and it is very, very unique and special when we're talking about late antiquity and early Christian art. So we're going to 
to look at some more examples of Ravenna um, influences of classical pagan world uh, in the Christian art of Rome. Um, we're going to look at illustrations. We're going to understand particularly um, the development, the origins, and how it relates to Ravenna, and so on. So changes. Examine the changes. All right. Well, okay. In Ravenna, inside the mausoleum of Galla Placidia, the building we were just looking at, this is the entrance wall. So when you first come in, you see this um, pretty striking lunette, right? A semicircular design that showcases Jesus as a good shepherd. But he's not just any old shepherd now. He's not just hanging out with the sheep anymore. Um, we now see some symbols, um, some iconographic symbols that are starting to be used. For instance, the nimbus, right? The nimbus is the halo of light around the head of a holy figure. So we call this a nimbus. Now, it is a nimbus in Christianity, right, would be around the head of Jesus as a holy figure. It could be around the Virgin Mary. It could be around any one of the saints or martyrs of Christendom. A nimbus could also be around the head of the Buddha or Muhammad or, you know, any other holy figure in various different types of religions, okay? But it is unique uh, in Christianity, well, the way that we see these developed into the mosaic. It's usually depicted as a flat, circular, golden disc. Um, and in this phase, they're pretty flat. It's just, you know, there's not a lot of modeling or, or dimensionality to them. They're just gold. <laughs> and um, we also see that Jesus is wearing a purple um, cloak here, a golden cloak with a pur purple drape, and purple and gold, but especially purple, were associated with the Roman emperors. Um, the Roman emperors wore purple robes um, that were, um, the dye was actually really stinky. It was uh, made from predatory sea snails, um, and just really, really stinky process, but it made this gorgeous purple. And so it was associated with royalty. So here we're seeing, you know, with Jesus holding the cruciform staff and the gold and the purple robe with the nimbus, we're seeing him as kind of more than just a shepherd, right? We're sort of seeing him as a king, right? Um, and these sheep, um, you know, students always crack up because they're like, sheep's tails don't really look like that. But actually, I did include an image of um, a sheep uh, whose tail does look like that. Um, I think today we think of sheep and lambs with little bit of cotton ball tails and so on, but they do have tails, some species of them do. So, <laughs> Okay, the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. Of course, this is one of the many miracles that Jesus performs in the um, scripture. And the miracle of the loaves and the fishes is the moralistic story that talks about the idea of sharing that the idea that oh you know there's the mass of the multitude of people right there's a crowd of people and they're all starving and jesus has like a few fish and a few loaves of bread and you know everybody's thinking oh gosh there's not going to be enough food for everybody uh you know whatever and he prays over the loaves and the fishes and he tells everybody basically to have faith and that there's going to be enough for everybody and that, um, you know, we're going to share with each other and believe me, by the end of it, you'll be, you'll, you'll have everything you need. And so they pass around the loaves and the fishes and people are like, oh gosh, I guess, you know, they eat uh, however much they need and they're so full. And at the end of it, there's apparently all this fish and bread left, you know? So it is a story of sharing, of not being greedy, not being selfish, um, a story of community 
a story about empathy, really. Um, and it's unique. So here we see the miracle, right? A miracle is something that really can't be explained logically. Um, how can you logically explain that just a few fish and a few pieces of bread are going to fill feed this multitude of people. In the scenery, we don't really see the multitude of people. We get the idea of figure clustering, but you know, the artists have kind of stylized the scene. And we also have some kind of weird confusions with like the space, like where is this other guy's other foot and so on. Um, so stylistically, there's kind of a flatness to the space. But we see Jesus again in purple robes, and this time his nimbus is golden, and it's bejeweled, and it blends into the golden sky. And definitely, for the next couple of chapters, we are going to be seeing lots and lots and lots of gold. Now, this golden tesserae tiled in Ravenna was one of the towns that were manufacturing golden glass tiles specifically for Christian mosaics. And basically what it is, is two pieces of glass with like gold leaf sandwiched in between. So they, you know, scintillate, they're shiny, and this is um, being produced and sold, right, uh, for these kinds of decorative projects. So it becomes quite the industri industrial center uh, for um, for art for artistry for Christian you know mosaics and uh, these new aesthetics um, how are they informing the art how is it different from the classical world uh, and let's look at illuminated manuscripts as a new medium so what is a manuscript well it's a book now, before manuscripts, the traditional format was the scroll format. And we had seen, you know, cylinder seals and examples um, like that uh, in the past as well. But illuminated manuscripts are books. And that means that they are typically going to be created on surfaces like parchment paper or vellum. So um, animal skin or lamb skin, paper. So paper made from the hide of an animal. That's how this is you know, traditionally uh, made. And then those leaves of paper are gonna be stitched together into like a codex and then many of those codexes then get stitched together to make bigger books, bigger manuscripts. So if you look at any book, for instance, if you kind of peek into the spine of a book, you'll see that there's the stitching of many different, you know, codices together to create that book. So you have the actual painting of the manuscripts. That's what an illuminated manuscript is. It's one that has pictures. You have the text, the idea of it as an historical document with actual text. Then you have the art form of the binding itself, the actual binding, the stitching, and then um, elaborate um, covers, right? It could be um, leather or they could be bejeweled or whatever. And then oftentimes these manuscripts uh, had elaborate cases that were built to house these books. Um, so some of these incredibly old books are housed in some of the world's most famous libraries like the Vatican or um, places in uh, Egypt, for instance, like at the Monastery of St. Catherine at the foot of Mount Sinai. Um, this example here um, from the Vatican Virgil is from 400 Common Era. You know, we're, we're looking at a book that is 1,600 years old, <laughs> and it still has text and images on it. Um, it's uh, one of the oldest surviving illuminated manuscripts, and it contains fragments of Virgil's Aeneid in it. Um, this is just one page uh, from you know, this uh, 
story, you know, the old farmer of Horcus. Um, but the name of the whole manuscript is the Vatican Virgil. When it says folio 7 verso, this is folio 7, so it's um, the seventh folio in the, in the manuscript. And verso, okay. So there's recto and verso. And that just means the front and the back, right? So verso is the, the front and uh, recto is the back. So when you're flipping a page, is it the front or the back of that page, right? So that is what that, that example means. And it's egg tempera painted onto parchment. And we can see um, the text is actually what we call unical letters. Here is a good example of a biblical manuscript. Um, this one is uh, from the Vienna Genesis. Um, so this is text from the fragment of the book of Genesis. Now, um, so when you're thinking about the Bible, right, the, in the case of the Old Testament, right, um, <laughs> these, the, the Bible, of course, today is printed in different versions, right? versions, you know, people um, oftentimes refer to the King James version of, of the Bible today. Um, <laughs> But there have been many different versions of the Bible over time, right? And notice how, um, you know, we're looking at uh, early examples of the early 6th century. Now, it's important to recognize, again, you know, it takes time for the dogma of Christianity to develop, right? So these um, biblical, uh, earliest biblical manuscripts... Um, are not created during the time of Jesus. In fact, none of the art that we're looking at is created during the time when Jesus is alive. <laughs> it takes a couple hundred years, right, before we start to see Christians able to come out, worship, build churches, you know, now manuscripts, you know. It takes time for these things to develop. So it's important to kind of recognize this in, the t in our timeline of understanding. Um, and so this text is the fragment of the book of Genesis. There are 20 surviving folios, each with miniatures at the bottoms of both sides. And it's thought that there were originally about 96 folios total and 192 illustrations. But again, it's fra fragments. Um, you know, these are incredibly old documents. It is written in unicals with silver ink on calfskin vellum dyed in a rich purple. And it has faded over time. And so has the silver lettering. It has tarnished a little bit over time. This shade of purple dye was also used to dye the imperial cloth of the Roman emperors. So that tells you how incredibly um, important this manuscript was and how much money, you know, cold hard cash, went into the production of this manuscript. Um, so we see stories of Rebecca and Eliza at the well. And so it's a continuous narrative. You can actually see Rebecca several times in the scene. Um, and the camels, the humpback camels there. All right, the Rosano Gospels. These are, these are incredibly famous. Um, they're one of the oldest surviving manuscripts from the New Testament. Um, and we see in this scene, Christ before Pontius Pilate. Uh, this is folio 8 verso of the Rosano Gospel from the early 6th century. So we see Pontius Pilate, and we see, um, of course, Jesus down here has been brought before um, the people to, um, you know, for them to judge him, right? And so Pontius Pilate has Jesus and a, a known criminal um, named Barabbas um, brought there, uh, and he asked the people, well, who do you want to see hung, right? Who do you want to see crucified? And the people are like, Jesus, you know? So he is um, condemned, right, to death by crucifixion. Now, in the scene, we can see the artist is using like a register, right? There's a horizontal band that separates, right, the two, the two scenes. 
Um, and we see, we can tell this is Jesus because he has the nimbus around his head. Um, and so this is, you know, us sort of starting to enter into the realm of the story of the events leading up to the crucifixion, right? The passion of Christ, right? This, the passion cycle, right? And we don't see that in the earliest days, right? In the earliest days, we see Jesus as a good shepherd and so on, um, a good teacher, a good shepherd. Um, and it's only now, right, where we're starting to see images of crucifixion. Um, so more examples from the Rosano Gospels. Um, they're the, some of the earliest surviving examples of the New Testament. So including the incomplete text of the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark. So, of course, um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were the four evangelists. Um, and we're seeing some incomplete text from those Gospels um, when it comes to the Rosano Gospels. And it is an illuminated manuscript, um, so there's pages of text and imagery. This uh, particular page, folio 121 recto, happens to be a, a full illumination um, showcasing St. Mark the Evangelist. He is uh, recording the scripture um, there. Um, and he's recording the word of God according to the New Testament. Okay, the suicide of Judas and the crucifixion of Christ. This is a plaque from a box, an ivory plaque. Um, and so it's a, it's a roughly small scale um, personal item, right, that somebody owned. And it's very meditative. What we're actually looking at is one of the earliest images that we have on record. This is from 420 Common Era. One of the earliest images that we have of a crucifixion of Jesus. And he's sort of short and squat. You know, in fact, everybody's really short and squat. They're only like about five heads tall here. And we see um, Jesus is, has been crucified. We see his eyes kind of wide open, and he's not in pain, really. I mean, he's very sort of stiff, you know. For somebody who's been crucified, typically they would be, you know, um, hanging, you know, dripping blood and, you know, wailing. Um, but he almost looks like he has, you know, superseded reality here. Um, he's looks like a very strong figure despite everything he's been through. In opposite to that, we see Judas, who's not looking so good. And of course, if you know the story, Judas, um, of course, betrays Jesus, right? With the, um, the Judas kiss, right? The kiss of death. And so what he does is he wants to, uh, take the bribe, he's bribed, you know, 40 pieces of silver uh, by the Romans, and so he, you know, rats out Jesus, and he tells the Roman soldiers, um, I will show you who Jesus is, I'm going to go up to him and I'll kiss him, and then you'll know which one is Jesus. And, of course, he goes up to Jesus, he gives him a kiss, and of course, Jesus knew, you know, at the Last Supper, he says, one of you is going to betray me. So he already kind of knew somebody would eventually betray him, and that person is Judas. So, of course, then the Romans, you know, with their spears and everything, they go and get Jesus. They bring him to the judgment, and then he's taken to crucifixion. So that kind of kickstarts everything that leads up to the eventual crucifixion of Jesus. So what we actually see here is Judas, and there's his little bag of silver down there, and he eventually commits suicide. You know, he's, he has um, felt guilty. He had a shame and guilt for what he did, and he commits suicide, and we can kind of see how sort of worthless that bag of silver actually was after that. And then this is sort of a little poignant moment we have um, a little bird's nest with some baby birds and a mama bird sort of feeding her baby birds. And so this is sort of a symbol of um, growth and fertility and, you know, abundance and, um, you know, the cycle of life. And so, 
you know, you have death, but then you have images of rebirth, right? That are so important to <laughs> every chapter that we've learned about, but obviously when it comes to um, the crucifixion of, of Jesus and um, the rebirth of Jesus, um, uh, for Christians, that is an important concept. Okay, uh, the woman sacrificing at an altar. Um, and we are seeing it's a diptych, uh, so it's a two panel scene on ivory. And it features an ivory crowned woman sprinkling incense over the flames of an altar that are garlanded with oak wreaths and a small attendant holding a cantharos and a bowl of fruit. Um, the oak garlands together with the oak tree overhead suggest the worship of Jupiter, while the ivy leaves were called Dionysus. The panel alludes to a revival of polytheistic past during a time when most were embracing monotheism. So it is important to recognize that it's not as if um, monotheism, like Judaism and Christianity, hit the scene and all of a sudden the pagan polytheistic past ceases to exist. That is just not true. There were plenty of, of polytheists still around uh, in four, the year 400 um, and still incorporating their symbols and their iconography as well. So that's something to also keep in mind um, about this time period of late antiquity and early Christian art. I had so much fun with you all today. Uh, this concludes our lecture and I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Bye.